Hello everyone, thank you so much for tuning in today. We have here Andrea Volpini, who is the CEO of Wordlifts, which is an AI tool where they um, are trying to apply the knowledge graph to today's search. Um, am I Am I right on this, <laughs> Andrea? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, and thanks for, for inviting me today. Yes. <laughs> today, we are going to be talking about the role of artificial intelligence in uh, information discovery and retrieval and how everything has evolved. It's, it's, it's a hot topic right now, isn't it? With all the search engine um, experience, sorry, the search um such a narrative experience uh, that Google has uh, already started to test out in the US uh, at the moment. It's, it's very exciting times for all of us SEOs, but also for marketers as a whole. Um, so Andrea, could you tell us a little bit more about the basics of artificial intelligence? What, what exactly it is that as SEOs we need to know in the first place? All right. Yeah. Um, let's let's look at the basic. Um, so, in general, when we design uh, um, an intelligent system, we want to emulate uh, some part of the intelligence that we see in humans, and that's that's how you know the entire uh, branch of research has always uh, uh, framed the problem of of creating intelligent systems. Now, in general. On, uh, on the, you know, if we look at uh, the history of of this uh, of this field, which is uh, you know quite recent, definitely hectic in the last uh, uh, few years, uh, yeah. it can be really divided into three main areas. Uh -huh. So there is the the deductive uh, part. Uh, of, of artificial intelligence, which is this area, this field of research that um, was um, originally uh, conceived to, to create uh, uh, expert systems and, um, and to design ontologies and, uh, and structure that uh, could infer new facts based on, you know, um, detailed instructions. And then there is this um, area um, of uh, inductive uh, artificial intelligence where we have been uh, studying models that uh, emulate the way in which the human brain function. Mm -hmm. And uh, we arrive to the design of neural networks. And so uh, actual uh, neurons that uh, can fire a response based on, uh, you know, a network of uh, other similar neurons. And um, the deductive uh, approach uh, uh, started with uh, Marvin Miski uh, back in the 60s and has had, wow. uh, has had his own uh, um, initial success over the other approach. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, uh, these, these neural networks uh, um, from the inductive approach became uh, more uh, popular and this has been uh, only um, happening recently when uh, we started to have uh, two elements you know enough data and, uh, and enough uh, computing power and uh, and now we are entering into a new phase uh, which uh, we can call abductive ai where we can start to combine uh, the strength of a, of an inductive system with the strength of a deductive system, and um, and that's that's why it is so exciting because we are uh, finally coming to to a place where we can talk about uh, uh, designing uh, artificial intelligent agents, so um, uh -huh. systems that can actually reason on on top of data, take decision, and then act on on this data. And of course, search has been uh, a great application of, of most of this technology over the last year. I mean, if we think Google uh, started to introduce uh, the knowledge graph back in uh, 2012. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, that's more than 10 years ago. 
And uh, how does this affect us as as search as as, as SEOs? Um, what what do we need to do to to handle this basically? Because we right. are kind of moving away from the um, the tra more traditional, uh, for lack of a better word, ways of optimizing websites. But um, it's also that it looks like perhaps um, users are actually perhaps moving away from their um, current way of uh, searching on the web. You know, the 10 blue links and doing the research. Um, I don't like this this website, go back to search and then click on another one. Perhaps that is actually ending. So uh, can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, so when when we started uh, to, to focus on SEO as a um, as a potential market fit for uh, for um, our tool uh -huh. uh, that uh, originally was born as a semantic editor. Uh, mm -hmm. We envision back in uh, 2015, uh, and even even before that, we envision uh, a different kind of user behavior that was um, that has been introduced already by Tim Berners Lee. Um, okay. when he first spoke about uh, the idea of moving from the World Wide Web to, to the Web of Data. Yeah. And, uh, and even, even before, uh, you know, Tim Berners-Lee uh, started to envision the semantic web, um, mm -hmm. others have, have tried to design a different uh, pattern for uh, information uh, consumption. So we began with this idea that rather than dealing with the 10 blue links, we would have dealt with, uh, with uh, voice search and mm -hmm. with agents. And of course, uh, back in uh, 2011, uh, uh, when we first started the research work, uh, it was still uh, very vague as an idea of uh, thinking of search as you know, becoming uh, an assistant. Uh, but it was clear to us that the web was was about to change, and that uh, AI would have become an interface to to, to information, and, and 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 this is happening now. But uh, also we've seen uh, you know major milestone in the past uh, ten years or so, you know the introduction of of Rank Brain uh, back in uh, in uh, in 2015. Uh, uh, you know the 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 development of uh, what is known as the knowledge vault, so kind of a repository of of information that uh, Google can leverage on. So mm -hmm. these usage pattern have been uh, you know evolving uh, over the last decade, but now it looks as if there is a tremendous acceleration on 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 you know the way in which we access uh, content, and uh, and this has become possible. As we had introduced, uh, you know, as we've seen the introduction of uh, the transformer architecture. Mm -hmm. Now, transformers have been introduced by Google uh, in 2017, and it's a um, um, very important uh, milestone in the development uh, of, um, you know, inductive AI and the creation of large language models. So basically, we can think about the evolution of artificial intelligence or the um, systems that we are now starting to explore more. Um, when we think about, uh, first of all, we needed to have a, a computing power in the first place, then data, and then obviously the development of the different technologies, such as uh, large language models or small language models, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah. am, I, am I correct? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, when we Just look at uh, the stack uh, that Google has to deliver, you know, within a millisecond, uh, so many disparate answers, then we're actually looking at uh, a stack of any AI application. So uh -huh. there is a knowledge graph where Google, you know, stores uh, information in the forms of triples. Mm -hmm. And then there are uh, language models that are uh, used uh, to understand uh, and elaborate uh, the query. I mean, mm -hmm. in 2018, uh, the introduction of BERT uh, has been a revolution because uh, with Definitely. BERT, uh, Google has started to interpret uh, the user intents and mm -hmm. to, to, to disambiguate uh, uh, these intents and to find the best match, um, you know, 
they talk about neural matching uh, mm -hmm. uh, in 2019. And so we have these language models that have been uh, pre-trained and, uh, and are capable of uh, generating embeddings. Mm -hmm. So we have a knowledge graph, we have a language models, and then these language model generates embeddings. Embeddings are vectors. They are a representation of uh, concepts within uh, a semantic space. Mm -hmm. um, so high density information compress uh, in, a, in, a, in a low dimensional space. Um, this is uh, the turning point of search because uh, the introduction of embeddings, it's what uh, makes uh, uh, Google intelligence and capable uh -huh. of understanding not only the query, but the content that we write. Right. It's very interesting. I haven't heard of the concept of embeddings before, but if I am understanding this correctly, um, those embeddings can only happen if there is a knowledge graph, which is uh, good enough for that language model to be able to uh, extract the information which they need to embed later on. Is this um, correct? What is the importance of the knowledge graph? Not mm -hmm. necessarily. So the knowledge okay. graph is, is really a repository of information, whether embeddings are uh, um, vectors, so numbers that uh -huh. can represent uh, how a piece of content or a single word is within a space where mm. other words reside. And uh, we can use and infuse the data in the knowledge graph to create embeddings. We can also create graph embeddings, which are uh, vectors built on top of the knowledge graph. But uh, if we want to keep things simple, embeddings are, you know, uh, just numbers that represent uh -huh. uh, uh, words and that allow to compute meanings. Let me give you an example. If I Space. create embeddings for queen, for the word queen, and then I create embeddings for king, then uh, I'm able to say that uh, if I, within the same space, if I talk about man, then the corresponding term would be women because, uh, you know, the king and the queen and, uh, and male and female are mm -hmm. within the same distance. So there is the same distance between uh, a king and a queen than there is between male and female. So these terms, are translated into numbers and these numbers are, you know, positioned into a space, three-dimensional, uh -huh. multi-dimensional, typically embeddings will have, you know, hundreds of dimension. And every dimension you have to imagine is, uh, is a way in which we can look at the content. It's like uh -huh. a point of view on that, on that word or a point of view on that sentence. Uh -huh. And so through the use of embeddings, we can uh, enable semantic search we can uh, start looking at, you know, meanings and finding matches. But this is not good enough in a way. Why? Because there are entities in the world. There are mm -hmm. concepts that represent person and products and uh, companies and uh, well-defined concepts. And we need a knowledge graph for that because uh, if I create the embeddings, for the string and travel penny, that's gonna be the same if I'm talking about myself or if I'm talking about a famous tennis player that has my same name. So the embeddings yeah. in some cases will not be able to represent uh, the richness of the world. And therefore they need to be combined with the, with the knowledge graph in order to properly disambiguate if that string correspond to that that person to that thing. I mean, the famous uh, introduction of the knowledge graph back in uh, 2012 was from yeah. strings to things. Mm -hmm. And uh, and even in the context of um, large language models and embeddings, we still need uh, structure for processing and organizing knowledge. And that's 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 what we have at the moment. So in these, uh, you know, evolve uh, uh, assistant or search mm -hmm. assistant, we do need a knowledge graph and we do mm -hmm. need uh, embeddings that are generated by, by language models. And this is kind of the foundation of the system. Then we can use different type of embeddings. We can traverse different nodes within the graph using graph embeddings. 
and then we need uh, you know language models that are uh, trained for generating content because maybe I need to create a feature snippet. Mm-hmm. And then maybe we have you know other components that create uh, the the features in search. Now, how does it change our work? You know, how our work in, in the SEO industry changes? That's that's, that's, what, that's what I would what like to know. How does it change, or how does it how it doesn't change? Maybe it doesn't change it, change that at all. We we don't so, know. So I think that uh, um, some some layers. I mean, I, I, we have to think as an onion, you know, with uh, with multiple yeah. layers, you know. At the core of it, we are still uh, creating a dialogue with another human being. We're hmm. doing this through the web. We're doing this through AI, but we're still, uh, you know, looking at uh, our client. We're looking at our reader. We're mm-hmm. looking at our audience. And so this kind of core layer of, 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 um, of communication uh, bring us back to McLuhan and, uh, you know, how uh, humans transfer information from, 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 from one to another. But okay. then, of course, uh, we, you know, we've been working in SEO a lot with uh, uh, the idea of uh, understanding search intents as keywords. And now we can, you know, we can clearly see that there is no point in looking at keywords, but we have to look at a broader scope. And then we can use the term search intents. Uh, we can use the term uh, NTD search. So we start to look at a cluster of um, queries, queries when uh, we start to do our work. So um, foundation is the same. We're talking with another human being, potentially. Uh-huh. We are also talking with algorithm because this algorithm will then talk with the human being that we want to reach. Uh, and therefore, so the other aspect that we have to consider is how much data we are adding to our content, because if I'm also dealing with algorithm uh, that needs to be trained, then hmm. providing data creates a lot of value. And so um, the way in which you change that, yes, we also have to look at not only the content, but also the data behind the content, because hmm. some algorithm will use this, this data for inferring you know, additional information from our piece of content. So it looks like um, our content strategy needs to be spot on these days, um, even more so than before, simply because we don't really want our um, content, uh, content which is not updated, perhaps not relevant, uh, not so much in depth, perhaps associated with our brand. And we don't want that, uh, that to uh, be used to train LLMs, for example, because we don't really want to perhaps spread that information, which is uh, yeah. which is not relevant. So this kind of brings me um, to um, to misinformation, fake information. Um, how can we perhaps uh, um, deal with this? How can we handle this? Apart from basically not putting out uh, contents out there, which is not good. <laughs> So there are several initiatives that uh, we, have to, we have to invest on. Um, mm. Fact-checking markup, it's definitely something that um, has been um, considered within the news and media industry, mm-hmm. but doesn't have uh, the relevancy that it should have. Um, because, you know, this is a way that allows, you know, um, anyone to formalize uh, a specific facts. Mm-hmm. And um, the other aspect is that um, we have to strengthen the ability to convert uh, unstructured text into structured yeah. because uh, with some level of structure, it's easier to reason and to validate. So um, something like uh, um, the recent, uh, in recently introduced uh, OpenAI uh, functions, mm-hmm. it's an inter- interesting frontier where uh, OpenAI is adding within um, its latest models the ability to trigger um, computational functions. Uh-huh. Now, by doing so, for example, uh, we can strengthen the ability of extracting facts out of a statement. 
And uh, by doing that, we can then, uh, you know, more easily validate and counter check with other available facts if that piece of information is true or not. The other approach, of course, is what Google has been investing on, you know, the double uh, EAT, um, mm-hmm. all the requirements that, uh, that Google has been uh, working on and focusing on to make sure that the content that we publish, it's authentic, uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's uh, coming from uh, uh, a source that uh, it's authoritative on that specific topic. And this is extremely important because that's that's yeah. one way of filtering out information. Of course, if you come to me and you want to read something about uh, pinball, maybe I'm not the right source of information. I'm good at talking at uh, AI uh, powered SEO, but I mean, in pinball, I'm not an expert. And so these these uh, these kind of uh, um, this approach is also uh, extremely valuable as we scale the production of content. Mm-hmm. There's another important element that we have to factor uh, because of generative AI. Mm-hmm. So in 2020, I started to work more in, uh, intensively on uh, transformers. And I started to work uh, with GPT-2 in the beginning. I mean, I've started generating content way before the transformers. But with the transformers, I got to the point where I could see value of these generated content in some specific uh, niche website where, uh, you know, I had enough data that could uh, uh, be used for creating content. And Uh so uh, three years ago, I started to generate uh, before hundreds and then thousands and then hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, snippets of text uh, using Uh uh, transformers and, and language models. Now, this means that uh, like uh, like us, uh, there are uh, uh, you know a vast number of people that have been creating synthetic content using AI, mm-hmm. and that means that it is becoming extremely difficult for Google to index all of this new content because it's almost generated on the fly now, and so that's why it's even more important what you were saying before that we have to be super careful on what we want to write and what we want to keep live. Because the ability to index the web are diminishing as more generated content, you know, um, is added to, 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 to the digital ecosystem. So it seems to me, again, that structure is super important. And I think this is a concept that as SEOs, we've been talking about all along. Um, when we are talking, for example, about... Um, navigation uh, so the, the the navigation in a website but now it's even more important to actually keep the nav- navigation logical <laughs> and, and understandable as well not just for assistive technologies for those with disabilities but also for language models um, large or small or small language models who uh, which actually are going to make uh, the the web uh, the new web so i wonder is this safe to think that the Web3 is going to be based on this as well, not just on blockchain? It's very hard. I'm not a Web3 expert, and I think there is an ambiguity in the term because um, in the semantic web community, we Mm -hmm. reference uh, Web3 as the evolution of uh, the social networks. Uh, into the web of data, but then Web3 yeah. uh, became uh, a different concept uh, uh, as, uh, you know, blockchain and, and crypto have been introduced. So it's it's very hard to talk about Web3 right now because what is Web3? Uh, but um, yeah. <laughs> I like to talk about generative web. The generative web, uh, it's, uh, you know, fundamentally different from, from the, the, the old web. Mm-hmm. And the reason is that uh, in the old uh, paradigm, uh, we, we publish static content, but, uh, but in a generative uh, web, uh, we publish static and dynamic content at the same time. And uh, I have this article uh, on, on our blog uh, where there is a, a small interactive component that allows you to talk with me as author of the article about mm-hmm. the article itself. And so the, the model in that case is uh, trained uh, in context mm-hmm. with the content of the article that I wrote 
and all the articles that I had uh, written in the past around the topic to create an experience that goes beyond the reading of the article. So there is still uh, the old content that I published, but mm -hmm. then there is this dynamic component that Google can also now starting to index. And maybe one day Google can reference as, you know, kind of a, a master bot for that mm -hmm. topic. So I can see that, uh, that, you know, as an evolution of SEO, we will also have to deal with these, uh, you know, uh, gatekeeper search engine or search assistant mm -hmm. that would reference, you know, uh, um, a specific uh, agent that has, you know, the knowledge on, on a given domain. And, uh, and, and I can see this as a new form of SEO, you know, uh -huh. to, to enable uh, these assistant to, to know that uh, there are other assistant on that specific topic that you can chat with. But again, the content on the web, it's, it's, it's both static and dynamic. Mm -hmm. I didn't publish a blog post. I published a blog post and I created an agent that can, you know, help you read and understand that blog post without even going through the process of reading. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the search results that we will actually get or we can get with artificial intelligence, I guess the uh, focus uh, can be, or one focus can be on accuracy and speed right? Um, also personalization, kind of all mixed together, so that I guess the kind of uh, um, results that I am looking for quickly, but then at the same time, I um, don't know, according to whatever I have been searching before. Is this, is this correct? Do you think, do you think we are going to be reaching a point where um, the accuracy of um, results is going to be spot on? Because it's not always I, like that right now. I, I think that the, um, the introduction of uh, chat GPT has brought us into this uh, new era of, uh, you know, uh, factually incorrect, uh, plausible content. Yeah. And so we are getting used to deal with uh, um, mistakes uh, and, uh, and, uh, and misleading uh, pieces of information that still mm. sound correct. Now, this is a transition phase. This is not, okay. uh, this is not acceptable uh, because, of course, uh, you know, we rely on content and expertise and, uh, and uh, in order to take decision in the real world, uh, we, we need to have, you know, accuracy. And then you mentioned the problem of speed, and this is also um, not just the problem of speed, but if you think about it, it's also a problem of uh, resources. Uh -huh. Because, uh, because uh, you know, running a query on um, using a language model, you know, increase the cost yeah, uh, by, by 10 or 20 times. Um, you know, the, the first figure was that, uh, you know, um, a query that uses, uh, you know, something similar to ChatGPT would cost Google uh, 20 times what it costs now. Mm -hmm. And um, and if we look at speed, speed is a is a very interesting uh, factor to analyze. If I make a very simple um, question to to ChatGPT, uh, such as I don't know who created uh, the School of Aidens, it would take five seconds for ChatGPT to respond. Mm -hmm. But if I do the same uh, on Google Knowledge Graph, uh, it would take uh, alpha second. And then if I do the same query on, on Wikidata, it would take uh, uh, 25, uh, you know, uh, one fourth of a second. It also costs and this, money as well. It costs and, money. And, and there's and, money because, yeah. of course, the, the yeah. infrastructure that Wiki, Wikidata runs on, it's, uh, you know, it's a very old uh, computer, whether mm. Google and, and OpenAI are using, you know, the most powerful computer in the world. So mm -hmm. there is cost and there is speed. And this example that I gave you was, uh, was provided uh, uh, by Danny, uh, who has been a co-founder of Wikidata. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of considered also the godfather of the Google Knowledge Graph because uh, he has been uh, you know, leading the team uh, uh, since the beginning on, 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 on Google Knowledge Graph. And so Danny and, of course, the team at Google understand that it's, it's, it's impractical to use a language model for you know narrating facts that we facts. can uh, store inside uh, a graph database 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not only impractical, but it also, you know, by leveraging on, on a knowledge graph, we can increase the level of accuracy mm-hmm. and we can use, uh, you know, models that have less parameters and therefore, you know, they consume less, less energy. I was going to say that actually by leveraging all these systems correctly, we can actually uh, lower down the uh, carbon emissions. The CO2 right. emissions of the uh, cloud computing at this moment in time are, are actually yeah. higher than that of sort aviation, of tobacco. Who would have known? It's, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty impactful. And this uh, AI hype, uh, you know, kind of uh, brought it to the sky. And uh, and now you know as this t- technology uh, become more uh, widely used, uh, we we have to seriously you know kind of reduce the the environmental impact. Uh-huh. And it's it's quite evident. Uh, I've done uh, several examples uh, in the past weeks of you know how accurate is the information that I can generate uh, by combining a knowledge graph with a language model uh-huh. versus relying on a language model as a knowledge base. Language models can act as knowledge base, but their architecture hallucinates by design. And Uh therefore, it's a nonsense to create these uh, ultra large models that have to store the world's knowledge because it's impractical and it doesn't Mm -hmm. work. You know, a language model, it's, it's, it's a network. It's a, it's a deep network with multiple layers, you mm-hmm. know, up to 64 in the case of uh, uh, GPT-4, if I'm not mistaken. And on every layer, a single token, which is a fraction of a word, has to go through, you know, all the different steps mm-hmm. and then be in process and then go back and then the next token will be, you know, going through the same chain until, you know, the sentence come out. And this uh-huh. is why it is tremendously slow. It's because the architecture is designed in such a way that you can estimate a prediction by going through multiple layers of, uh-huh. you know, with billions of parameters. But uh-huh. doing that, um, of course, uh, takes a lot of energy and time. Yeah. And so when it is not strictly necessary, we have to prevent it. And so next question would be, when is oh. really necessary to leverage on a language model and when we should rely on, you know, existing knowledge bases or, or, or knowledge graphs? graphs. Or, yeah. That's very interesting, actually. Um, I think I think it's a matter of getting to know perhaps what we've got in our hands, getting to know the technology, and then deciding how to um, how to manage it, basically how to how to leverage it in in a, in a good way. So yeah. I wonder, I wonder, just just to to, uh, to finish this, there's a very interesting conversation. I would really love to kind of expand on it a lot because. Um, because I think it's, it's really relevant at, at this moment in time, but it will be in the future. So what are the three things you would tell SEOs at this moment in time? Just to summarize uh, right. all this and to get ready for it. Yeah. So first thing first, um, remember the importance of structured data uh-huh. because any AI out there needs data, data, you know, and um, Tony Seal recently used this expression, AI is an iceberg, it's the tip of the iceberg, but the data underneath is what really makes it exist. There wouldn't be AI that. without data. Mm-hmm. So first thing first, focus on your structured data, even in small organization, creating, you know, an healthy um workflow for publishing structured data alongside with content will create, you know, a difference as, as you progress. And as you start experimenting more with these generative uh, uh, tools that uh, would allow you to um, scale up the content production. Number two, remember that you are not talking with an AI, you're talking with a human being. And so regardless of, you know, what technology you are planning to use or you're using within your uh, SEO um, workflow, Mm -hmm. you have a human 
that you're talking on the other side. And, uh, and therefore, you want to, you know, keep uh, integrity um, as, as an important value b- mm-hmm. when you create content. And uh, number three, um, there is a, on the web, even on the generative web, there is always an network effect. And, uh, and that means that distribution remains uh, along with, the, of course, the power of the brand, an important element. Mm-hmm. If Google will disappear tomorrow, how would you, you know, make your content easy to be found? How can you still uh, uh, let your client be seen, you know? And um, in the old days, that would be, okay, well, invest on, on, on links, invest on, uh, you know, uh, digital PR. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I talk more about a network effect, you know, how are you syndicating your data and your content? Yeah. Um, so these are, these are, you know, kind of the three things that, uh, that I, would, uh, I would focus on. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. And lastly, how do you uh, switch off? I mean, how do you switch off from the world of data and artificial intelligence? What do you do? Um, uh, Do you prefer reading? Do you prefer, what what would you advise our audience to do? Uh, Well, that's, that's a very personal question. Um, So (laughs) I read a lot and, uh, and uh, lately I do tend to read uh, more uh, research paper than, uh, than literary book, but, but, uh, you know, reading is definitely something that I use a lot to switch off. Um, I'm also um, very happy when I go hike uh, on the mountains and I go running uh, uh, in the city. So I think every, you know, having a solid, uh, um, you know, uh, outdoor activity uh, helps mm-hmm. uh, our brain function better. And so that's, uh, that's what I would suggest. I definitely share that uh, feeling with you. Uh, hiking is something that I do from time to time. Not now, which is so, so, so hot. Yeah, it's super this hot. Time. <laughs> but hiking is something that I tend to do. Kind of nature uh, makes yeah. me switch off from things very, very easily. And then I come back home. I'm all tired. <laughs> don't make any mistakes. Yeah. But uh, I don't know, with my mind full of ideas, uh, the ideas start to be generated very, very easily. Yeah. <laughs> so this was the, the my last question thank you so much Andrea for this conversation I really hope that uh, our uh, audience will actually find it as insightful as I have and uh, well thank you so much uh, for everything I'll see you see you around on the Serps <laughs> yeah yeah thanks to you thanks to you <laughs> cheers bye All right. All right. Oh, wow. Good.